Hello everyone. Welcome to phase 2 of the Pico series tutorials made by Waveshare. Phase 2. GPIO Peripheral. In the last phase, we introduced the basic hardware of Pico and realized LED sliding. But you may ask how to realize LED lighting? The answer is to use the GPIO peripheral. If you are careful, you may find that we use the word peripheral, and you would be curious. All I used is RP2040 chip, and there is no more peripheral? Here we need to understand a concept. The word peripheral is used to refer to external devices. In the early days, UART, LCD controllers, and the CPU were not on a chip. So it was called external devices, referred to as peripherals. But with the development of semiconductor technology, various external devices have been integrated into a single chip. We also can call them peripherals. We call the peripherals outside the chip external peripherals. The same is true for the internal chip, but the external devices outside the kernel are called the on-chip peripheral, which is the peripheral we mentioned above. Now we need to really understand. Our first peripheral, GPIO, is general purpose input, output. In short, GPIO is the pins that the MCU can directly control. The MCU often connects to external devices via GPIO pins for controlling, reading, and communication. Arguably, GPIO is the most important function of most MCUs and is the main way to connect to external devices. Now, we can see the system overview diagram of the RP2040. And it is not difficult to see that the kernel can directly control the GPIO via SIO. However, external devices such as SPI can only achieve their functions with GPIO. Our lighting program is to turn on or off the LED by controlling the level of GPIO output. GPIO internal structure. Now, let's learn how GPIO realizes input and output. We can see that there are four output parts, slew rate, output enable, output data, and drive strength. The slew rate determines the GPIO flip speed, the output enable determines whether to output, the output data determines the output level, and the drive strength determines the driving capability of the GPIO. There are three input parts, input enable, input data, and Schmidt trigger. The input enable determines whether the input can be input, the input data is the level of the input GPIO, and the Schmidt trigger is whether to use the Schmidt trigger. It should be noted that MicroPython at this stage cannot control the output speed, output capability, and input hysteresis. According to the above chart, the state of GPIO can be divided into four categories, namely open drain output, floating input, pull up input, and pull down input. Function Description Before we start programming, we need to understand the class and functions we may use. The first thing we see is the constructor function in the machine pin class, whose role is to initialize the GPIO according to the parameters and return. The first parameter, ID, represents the GPIO number, the value should be between 0 and 29. For example, if GPIO 13 is used, it should be filled in as 13. The second parameter mode represents the GPIO mode, which can be set to not initialize the input mode, output mode, and open drain mode. The third parameter pull is to use the internal pull-up resistor or pull-down resistor, which can be set to pull up, pull down, and none. Note that this parameter is only valid in input mode. The fourth parameter is the output value, which is valid in output mode and open drain mode. We now see the init function of the pin class, which reinitializes the GPIO. The parameters are the same as the constructor of the pin class, so I won't go into details here. The value function in the pin class is used to return the value of the GPIO port without filling in the parameter. In the case of filling in the parameter, the parameter is written into the GPIO port, and the parameter can be 0 or 1. The toggle function in the pin class is used to toggle the port once in output or open drain mode. The above four functions are all used in output mode or open drain mode, pin.low, and pin.off. Functions set the port value to 0, pin.high and pin.on set the port value to 1. The IRQ function in the pin class is an external interrupt function. The first parameter is the interrupt trigger callback function, and the second parameter is the interrupt trigger condition, which can be set to edge trigger or frequency trigger. Now, we have a general understanding of GPIO hardware and its related functions. We now enter our practical part. The materials we need to prepare are as follows, a pico with soldered headers, a breadboard, 
a button, a LED, a resistor with proper resistance, and wires. Here we connect the button to GPIO 15, connect the external LED to GPIO 16, and limit the current with a 1K resistor. Now, let's program. Here we have written a program, and now we will explain it in detail. The first two lines import the pin class and uTime library of the machine library, respectively. Now let's look at two ways to import the pin class in the machine library. The former will import the entire machine library, and the latter will import the pin class in the machine library, separately. Compared with the former, the latter occupies less memory. Here we set GPIO 15 as pull-up input mode, GPIO 16 and GPIO 25 are set as output mode. Take GPIO 15, the button, as an example. This line is to create a GPIO number 15, the input mode and uses the internal pull-up pin object and assign it to the button. Now we see the next part of the code. Here, the value of GPIO 15 will be read and judged whether it is zero. If it is zero, it means that the button is pressed, it will wait 10 milliseconds to redetermine whether the button is pressed. And if it is still pressed, it will start to execute the next step. Here is one more thing you need to know. Does anyone know why we wait for 10 milliseconds to determine whether to press the button? In actual situations, when the mechanical contacts are opened or closed, due to the bounce of the mechanical contacts, a key switch will not be stably connected together when it is closed, nor will it be disconnected all at once when it is disconnected. Therefore, bouncing will be generated at the moment of closing or opening. In order to avoid this problem, it is necessary to do a button debounce. Debouncing in the software or hardware all has its own advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of hardware debouncing is less cost on software, and the disadvantage is that hardware cost is high. The advantage of software debouncing is that the hardware cost is lower, and the disadvantage is more software cost. Here we have designed a software debouncing, that is, a 10 millisecond delay is performed after the button is detected, and the button state is detected again after the leading edge bouncing disappears. If the level of the closed state is still maintained, it is considered that there is a button pressed before entering the processing program of the button. Here is the button handling program, when the button is pressed, GPIO 16, external underscore LED, toggles, set GPIO 25 to a high level, and then waits for the key release through a while loop. Then it will go back to the top of this code and set GPIO 25 to a low level, then wait for the button to be pressed again. The program explanation is over here. Now let's download the program to our board and see the actual effect. This tutorial is over here, I hope you can give us a like. See you next time.